bright-eyed Athena, then placed inside the heart of wise Penelope, Icarius's daughter, the thought that she should set up in Odysseus's halls, the bow and grey iron axes for the suitors, as a competition and prelude to their deaths. She climbed the lofty staircase to her upper rooms, picked up in her firm grip a curved key made of bronze. It had an ivory handle fashioned with great skill. With her attendant, she went off to a storeroom in a distant corner of the house, where they kept her lord's possessions, bronze and gold and iron, all finely crafted work. His well-sprung bow was there, and quivers too, with many death-dealing arrows. Presents he had received from Iphitus, his friend, son of Eurytus, a man like the immortals. When they met in Lacedaemon, in Messene, at the home of wise Ortilicus, Odysseus had gone there to collect a debt the people owed. Messenian men had run off with three hundred sheep, seizing the shepherds too, and then left Ithaca in their ships with many oars. In response to this, Odysseus, who was just a young lad, had been sent a long way by his father and other senior men, part of an embassy. Iphitus was searching for twelve mares he'd lost, along with some sturdy mules still on the teat. In later years, these animals brought him a fatal destiny, the day he met the mortal Heracles, Zeus's great-hearted son, who knew all there was to know about great exploits. Hercules slaughtered him, although he was a guest in his own home, a cruel man who did not care about God's anger or the welcoming table he'd set before him. After their meal, Hercules killed Iphitus and killed the mares with him at home for his own use. While Iphitus was inquiring about these horses, he got to meet Odysseus and offered him the bow. Earlier, this weapon belonged to mighty Eurytus, who, when he died, left it to his son living in his high-roofed home. Odysseus had given him a keen-edged sword and a powerful spear as well. This was the start of their close friendship. Iphitus gave Odysseus the bow of his, but the two men never bonded as mutual guest friends. Before that could take place, Hercules had murdered Iphitus, Eurytus's son, a godlike man. Odysseus did not take the bow when he set off in his black ships to fight. It lay there in his home as a memorial to a dear friend and for his use in Ithaca. When fair Penelope came to the storage room, she crossed the wooden threshold. A long time ago, a skillful craftsman planned it, set it straight and true, then fitted doorposts and set shining doors in place. Penelope swiftly took the looped throng from its hook, put in the key, and with a push shoved back the bolt. Just as a bull grunts when it grazes in a field, that how the door creaked as she pushed it with the key, and it quickly swung ajar. Then she clambered up onto the planking where they kept the sword trunks, in which they stowed their fragrant clothing. There she stretched to take the bow in its bright case down from its peg. Then she sat down, placed the bow case across her knees, and wept aloud as she took out her husband's bow. When she had had enough of her laments and tears, she crossed down to the hall to join the noble suitors, holding in her hand the well-sprung bow and quiver with many pain-inflicting arrows. And with her came some attendant slaves carrying in a chest lots of iron and bronze, her husband's battle gear. Once the lovely lady reached the suitors, she stood beside the doorpost of the well-constructed hall, with a bright veil covering her face. On either side stood a loyal attendant women. Then Penelope addressed the suitors with these words. Listen to me, bold suitors, who've been ravaging this home with your incessant need for food and drink, now that my husband's been away so long. The only story you could offer up as an excuse is that you all desire to marry me and take me as your wife. So come now, suitors, since I seem to be the prize you seek. I'll place this great bow here, a weapon that belonged to brave Odysseus. Whichever one of you can grip this bow and string it with the greatest ease, then shoot an arrow through twelve axes, all of them. I'll go with him, leaving my married home. This truly lovely house and all these goods one needs for a living, things I'll remember, even in my dreams. When she'd said this, 
She told Eumaeus, the good and faithful swineherd, to set the bow and iron axes for the suitors. With tears in his eyes, Eumaeus took the weapons and laid them out. The Loitius, the goat herd, was weeping too, in another spot, once he saw his master's bow. Then Antinous addressed them both with this reproach. You foolish bumpkins, who only think of what's going on today. What a wretched pair. Why start weeping now? Why stir the heart inside the lady's chest? Her spirit lies in pain, now that she's lost the man she loves. Go sit and eat in silence, or go outside and weep. Leave the bow here. The contest will decide among the suitors. I don't think it will be an easy feat to string that polished bow. Of all men here, no one is like Odysseus used to be. I saw him for myself, and I remember, though at the time I was a little child. Antinous spoke. In his chest his heart was hoping he would string the bow, and with it shoot an arrow through the iron. But, in fact, he would be the first to taste an arrow from brave Odysseus's hands, the very man he was disgracing shamefully, as he sat in the hall inciting all his friends. But then among them all Telemachus spoke out with royal authority. Well now, Zeus, son of Kronos, must have made me foolish. My dear mother, although quite sensible, says she'll be leaving with another man, abandoning this home, and I just laugh. My witless heart finds that enjoyable. So come, suitors, since your prize seems to be a woman who throughout Achaean land has no equal, not in sacred Pelos, Argos, Mycenae, or on the mainland, or in Ithaca itself. But you know this, so I do not need to praise my mother. Come on now, don't delay this contest with excuses or use up too much time diverting your attention from this bow. Then we'll see. I might try the bow myself. If I can string it and shoot an arrow through the iron, I won't get so upset when my royal mother has to leave here with another man. I'd be left behind as someone capable of picking up my father's prizes in a competition. As he said this, Telemachus quickly threw off the purple cloak covering his back, then jumped up and removed the sharp sword hanging from his shoulders. He set up the axes by digging out a trench one lengthy ditch for all of them, in a straight line. Then his feet trampled the earth down flat around them. Amazement gripped the suitors as they looked at him, and watched how he aligned those axes properly, though before he had never seen them. Then, going and standing in the threshold, he tried to test the bow. Three times he made it tremble, as he strove to bend it, and three times he relaxed hoping in his heart he'd string that bow and shoot an arrow through the iron. On his fourth attempt, as his power bent the bow, he might have strung it, but Odysseus shook his head, signaling him to stop for all his eagerness. Telemachus spoke out, addressing them once more with royal authority. Well, I suppose I'll remain a coward, a weak man too, in future days, or else I'm still too young and cannot yet rely on my own strength to guard me from a man who gets angry with me first. But come now, you men who are more powerful than me, test this bow. Let's end this competition. Once he said this, Telemachus placed the bow down on the ground away from him, leaning it against the polished panels of the door, and set a swift arrow there beside the bow's fine tip, then sat down in the chair where he had been before. Then Antinous, Eupathy's son, addressed him. All you suitors, get up in order now, from left to right, beginning from the place where the steward pours the wine. Antinou spoke, and what he had proposed they found agreeable. The first to stand was Leodes, son of Enops, their soothsayer. He always sat furthest away beside the lovely mixing bowl, the only man who opposed their recklessness. It made him angry at the entire crowd of suitors. That was the man who first picked up the bow and the swift arrow. After moving to the threshold and standing there, he tried the bow, but he could not string it. His hands, which were quite delicate and feeble, grew weary before he could succeed in hooking up the string. He then spoke out among the suitors. My friends, I'm not the man to use this bow, so now let someone else take hold of it. This bow will take away from many fine young men their lives and spirit, since it's far better to die than live and fail in 
the attempt to have what we are gathered here to get. Remaining here in hope day after day, now every man has feelings in his heart. He desires and hopes to wed Penelope, Odysseus' wife. But when, when, when he's, he's tried this bow and observed what happens, then let him woo another of Achaea's well-dressed women, seeking to win her with his bridal gifts. And then Penelope can wed the man who offers her the bows, whose fate it is to be her husband. When Laodice had finished, he set the bow beside him, leaning it against the polished panels of the door, and placing with it a swift arrow by the tip. Then he sat down again where he had been sitting. But Antinous took issue with what he had said, talking directly to him. Laodice, that speech that passed the barrier of your teeth, what wretched sorry words. As I listened, it made me angry, as if this bow would, in fact, take away the lives and spirits of the very finest men, just because you could not string it. Your royal mother did not produce in you the sort of man who has sufficient strength to draw a bow and shoot an arrow, but some other men among these noble suitors will succeed. Come now, Melanthius, light a fire in the hall, set a large chair in front of it and spread a fleece across, then fetch a hefty piece of fat. There's some inside the house, so that these young men here can warm the bow and rub grease into it, then test the bow and end this competition. Once Antinous said this, Melanthius soon lit a tireless fire. Then he carried a large chair up, draped a fleece on it, set it down beside the fire, and from inside the house fetched a large piece of fat. So then the young men warmed the bow and tested it, but they could not string it. Whatever strength they had was far too little. Antinous and Eurymachus, the suitors' leaders, still remained. The two of them, with their abilities, were by far the best men. The cattle herder and the keeper of the swine belonging to godlike Odysseus had gone out, both together, so Lord Odysseus moved away, left the palace, walked through the yard, and followed them. When they had passed beyond the courtyard and the gates, Odysseus called to them with reassuring words. You there! Cattlemen and swineherd, shall I tell you something or keep it to myself? My spirit tells me I should speak to you. If Odysseus were to come back suddenly, brought from somewhere by a god, would you two be the sort of men who would defend him? Would you support the suitors or Odysseus? Answer as your heart and spirit prompt you. O oh, Father Zeus, would that you might fulfill this very wish. May that man come and led on by some god. Then you would know the kind of strength I have and how my hands can demonstrate my power. And then Eumaeus too made the same sort of prayer to all the gods that wise Odysseus would come back to his own house. Once Odysseus had clearly seen how resolute they were, he spoke to them again, saying these words. Well, here I am, in person. After suffering much distress, I've come home, back in the 20th year to my own land. Of those who work for me, I recognize that you're the only two who want me back. Among the rest, I have heard no one praying that my return would bring me home again. I'll tell you both how this is going to end, and I'll speak the truth. If on my behalf some god will overcome those noble suitors, I'll bring each of you a wife. I'll provide possessions and a house built near my own. Then you'll be my companions and kinsmen of Telemachus. Come, I'll show you something, a sign, so you will clearly know it's me. And trust me in your hearts. Sit. Paw. <laughs> Paw. Here's the old scar I got from a boar's white tusk on a visit to Parnassus with Autolycus's sons. As he said this, Odysseus pulled aside his rags, exposing the great scar. 
Once the two had seen it and noted every detail, they both threw their arms around the wise Odysseus. Bursting into tears, they welcomed him, kissing his head and shoulders. Odysseus did the same. He kissed their heads and hands. These men would have kept on weeping until sunset if Odysseus had not called a halt, saying to them, Stop these laments. Let's have no more crying. Someone might come out from the hall, see us, and tell people in the house. Let's go in, one by one and not all at once. I'll go first, you come later, and let's make this our sign. All those other men, the noble suitors, will not allow the quiver and the bow to be given to me. But, Eumaeus, as you carry that bow around the hall, put it in my hands and tell the women to lock their room, bolt the clothes-fitting doors, if any of them hears the noise of men groaning or being hit inside our walls, she's to stay quiet. Working where she is and not run off outside. Now, as for you, Poetius, I want you to lock the courtyard gates, bolt and lash them shut. Do it quickly. After he said this, Odysseus went back into the hall and sat down on the stool where he had been sitting. The two men, godlike Odysseus' servants, went in after him. Eurymachus already had the bow in his hand, warming it here and there in the light from the hot fire. But even doing that, he could not string the bow. Then his courageous heart gave out a mighty groan, and he spoke to them directly. He was angry. It's too bad. I'm frustrated for myself and for you all. I'm not unhappy about the marriage, though I am upset. There are many more Achaean women, some here in Seeker, Ithaca itself, others in various towns. But if we are so weak compared to God like Odysseus that we can't string his bow, it's a disgrace which men will learn about in years to come. Eurymachus, that's not going to happen, as you yourself well know. At this moment, in the country, it is a feast day, sacred to the god. So who would bend the bow? No, set it aside without saying a thing. As for the axes, what if we let them just remain there? I don't think anyone will come into the home of Odysseus, Laertes' son, and carry them away. Come now, let the steward begin to pour wine in the cups, so we can make libations. Put the curved bow down, and in the morning, tell goat herd Melanthius to bring in the finest goats by far, from all the herds, so we can set out pieces of the thigh for the famous archer god, Apollo. Then we'll test the bow and end the contest. Antinous finished. They were pleased with what he said. Heralds poured water on their hands, and young men filled the mixing bowls up to the brim with drink and served them all, pouring a few drops in the cups to start the ritual. Once they had poured libations and drunk wine to their heart's content, Odysseus, a crafty man who had a scheme in mind, spoke out. Suitors of the splendid queen, listen to me, so I can say what the heart here in my chest is prompting me to state. It's a request, a plea, especially to Eurymachus and godlike Antinous, since what he said was most appropriate. For the moment, you should postpone this business with the bow and turn the matter over to the gods. In the morning, a god will give the strength to whoever he desires. But come now, give me the polished bow. So in this hall, I can test these hands of mine and find out if my supple limbs still possess the strength they used to have, or if my wanderings and my lack of food have quite destroyed it. Odysseus finished. They were extremely angry, fearing that a beggar might string the polished bow. So Lord Antinous, addressing him directly, took Odysseus to task. You wretched stranger, your mind lacks any sense. You've none at all. Aren't you content to share a feast with us, such noble men, without being disturbed or lacking any food, and to listen to the words we speak to one another? No other beggar or stranger listens in on what we say. The wine, so honey-sweet, has injured you as it harms other men, who gulp it down and swallow far too much. Wine befuddled even great Eurytion, the centaur, 
and braved Carathus's house when he'd gone to the Lapids. Afterwards, when his mind was blinded by drinking wine, in a mad fit he committed evil acts in Carathus's home. Grief seized the heroes. They all leapt up and hauled him out of doors, through the gate, then cut off his ears and nose with pitiless bronze. His wits were reckless, and he went on his way, bearing madness in his foolish heart. And that's the reason the fight between centaurs and men began. But he first discovered evil in himself when loaded down with wine. And so I say, if you string the bow, you'll face great trouble. You'll not get gentle treatment anywhere, not in this land. We'll ship you off at once in a black ship over to King Echetus, who likes to kill and torture everyone. You won't escape with him, escape from him. So drink your wine in peace and don't compete with younger men. Antinous, it's neither good nor proper to deny guests of Telemachus a chance, no matter who it is comes to this house. And of trusting in his strength and power, the stranger strings Odysseus's great bow. Do you believe this man will take me home and make me his wife? I'm sure he himself bears no such hope inside that chest of his. So none of you sh should be at dinner here with sorrow in your heart because of him, that would be undignified. Wise Penelope, daughter of Vicarius, we do not think this man will take you home. That would be wrong, but we would be ashamed by public gossip from both men and women if later on some basic Ian spoke of us like this. Those men wooing the wife of that fine man are far worse than him. They can't even string his polished bow, and yet another man, a beggar who came here on his travels, did so with ease and then shot through the iron. That's what men will say, and those words would be a slur on us. Eurymachus, there is no way at all there will be in this district good reports of those dishonoring and eating up a noble's home. Why turn the matter now into a slur? The stranger's very large and strongly built. Furthermore, he maintains that by birth he comes from a good father. So come now, offer him the polished bow, and let us see. I will say this to you, and it will happen. If he strings the bow and Apollo grants him glory, I'll dress him in some lovely clothes, a cloak and tunic, and give him a sharp spear as a defense from dogs and men, as well as a fine sword and sandals for his feet. Then I'll send him wherever his heart and spirit prompt him. Mother, among Achaeans, no man has a right stronger than my own to offer this bow to anyone I wish, or to withhold it. None of those who rule in Laki, Ithaca, or in the islands neighboring Elis, were horses grooms. Among these men, no one will deny my will by force if I wish to give the bow. Even to this stranger is an outright gift to take away with him. But, mother, you should go to your own rooms and keep busy with your proper duties, the loom and spindle, and tell your women to go about their tasks. The bow will be a matter for the men, especially me, since power in this house is justly mine. Penelope, astonished, went back to her chamber, taking to heart the prudent words her son had said. With her servant women, she walked up to a room and there wept for Odysseus, her dear husband, till bright-eyed Athena cast sweet sleep on her eyes. The worthy swineherd had picked up the curving bow and was carrying it. But the suitors in the hall started shouting. One of those arrogant young men then said something like, What are you doing, you wretched swine herd, carrying that bow, you idiot? You'll soon be with the swine all alone. No one there, being eaten by the swift dogs you yourself have raised if Lord Apollo acts with graciousness to us. That's what they said. So, though the bow was in his hands, he put it down. He was afraid. So many men inside the hall were yelling at him. But then, from across the room, Telemachus shouted out a threat. 
Old man, keep on moving up here with that bow or else you may regret it. I'm younger than you, but I might force you out into the fields and throw rocks at you. I'm the stronger man. I wish my hands had that strength and power over all the suitors here. I would force some of them soon enough to leave this house and go back home. They would not be happy. The schemes they keep concocting are unjust. Telemachus finished speaking, but the suitors all had a hearty laugh at his expense. This eased their bitter anger at Telemachus. Meanwhile, the swineherd had kept on moving through the hall, carrying the bow. He came to shrewd Odysseus and placed it in his hands. Then he summoned the nurse, Eurycleia, and said to her, Wise Eurycleia, Telemachus is telling you to lock up the closely fitted doorway to this hall. If anyone hears groans inside this room, or any noise from men within these walls, she's not to run outside, but stay in there, busy with her work, and saying nothing. After he had said this, her words could find no wings. She bolted all the doors to that well-furnished hall. And Philoetus, without a word, slipped out and locked the courtyard gates inside the sturdy walls. A cable from a curving ship was lying there by the portico, made of papyrus fibers. With that, he lashed the gates tight shut and went inside, moved the chair where he had been before, sat down, and watched Odysseus, who already had the bow. He was turning it this way and that, testing it in different ways to see if, while the Lord was gone, worms had nibbled on the horns. One of the suitors, with a glance beside him, would say something like, This man knows bows. He must be an expert. Either he has bows like this stored at home, or else he wants to make one. That is why he's turning it around in all directions. That beggar's really skilled in devious tricks. Well, I hope the chance that this brings him some benefit matches his ability to string this bow. That is how the suitors talked. But shrewd Odysseus, once he had raised the weapon and looked it over from every angle, then, just as someone really skilled at playing the lyre and singing has no trouble, when he loops a taut string around a brand new peg, tying the twisted sheep gut down at either end, that's how easily Lord Odysseus strung that bow. Holding it in his right hand, he tested the string. It sang out, resonating like a swallow's song beneath his touch. Grief overwhelmed the suitors. The skin on all of them changed color. And then Zeus gave out an ominous sign, a peal of thunder. Lord Odysseus, who had endured so much, rejoiced. Crooked-minded Cronus's son had sent an omen. Then he picked up a swift arrow lying by itself on the table there beside him. The other ones, which those Achaeans soon would be familiar with, were stored inside the hollow quiver. He set it against the bow on the bridge, pulled the notched arrow and the bowstring back, still sitting in his seat, and with a sure aim let fly. It did not miss, not even a single hole in all the axe heads. The arrow weighted with bronze, sped straight on through and out the other end. At that point, Odysseus called out to his son. Telemachus, the stranger sitting in your halls has not disgraced you. I did not miss my aim or work too long to string that bow. My strength is still intact in spite of all the suitors' scornful jibes. Now it's time to get a dinner ready for these Achaeans, while there's still some light. Then entertain ourselves in different ways with singing in the lyre. For these are things which should accompany a dinner feast. As he spoke, he gave a signal with his eyebrows. Telemachus, godlike Odysseus's dear son, cinched his sword belt tight, closed his fist around a spear, moved in close beside his father, next to his seat, and stood there by him, fully armed with gleaming bronze.